How many of you, if you just want to be real honest, would say, you know the good things that you ought to do, but you sometimes don't get around to doing them? Every one of you. Two of you admitted that. I see, Karen, you're honest. I got gotcha. you. Even simple things like this. You know your body needs rest. And you know you should hit the sack at a decent hour. But you just can't get off Facebook. You just can't put that book down. You just got to watch that more movie. And you just got to see Jimmy, o. Fallon, Jimmy Fallon, whatever. And you just can't get to bed on time. And many of us have a problem with this quite often. If you want to raise your hand, you could. Problems with getting to bed on time. Uh, another problem, uh, exercise. We Americans are so bad at this, you know. Uh, we say we want to exercise. We even go out and get the, the gym clothes, and we look all cool. We got the apparel. We even have the promises and the plan. We sign up for the gym membership, and some of us have all the great and best intentions, but then sometimes we don't actually exercise. Or you know the good that you ought to do when it comes to your diet. You really ought to eat more of X and less of Y, and you really ought to drink less of this and more of that. You know, I, that's me. If you're American, that's you. <laughs> I'm 40 years old now, unfortunately, and my wife made me go to the doctor a couple weeks ago, and the doctor said, you got really high triglycerides. I'm like, I don't know what that is, but I think it sounds like I want those things. What's a triglyceride? And he's like, you don't want those things. I'm like, oh, great. He said, you have to exercise more, and you need to stop eating so poorly. <laughs> I'm like, are you serious? So now... Pray for me, I'm recovering from my addiction to McDonald's. <laughs> if you see me in there, you just come and get me and scream intervention because my doctor says <laughs> I'm not supposed to be bothering in there. And you guys know I am a McDonald's man. One of my dreams was to own a McDonald's. And maybe one of these days I'll own it, but I just won't eat, it, eat there. It would help if there wasn't those demon-possessed McDouble uh, cheeseburgers. Goodness, how can you refuse them? They're so cheap and so delicious. Is there a healthy McDonald's? Oh, yeah. Well, nobody would shop there. If it's... <laughs> I'm in the midst of my own recovery, is my point. Um, and even in deep, profound ways, spiritually, we know the good things we ought to do, and you could fill in the blank. You ought to serve. You ought to care. You ought to make a difference in the community. You ought to give. You ought to have a good attitude. You ought to use right words. You ought to make wise. You know all the good that you ought to do, but sometimes you don't do it. You know the things that you do sometimes that you know are wrong, but sometimes you do it anyway. In fact, if you're honest with yourself, there's probably a broken record syndrome going on in your life, particularly maybe about one or two issues that are repetitive issues. Failure after failure after failure. Poor choice after poor choice after poor choice. That's me. And that's probably you too, if you're honest. Today what we're talking about is starting a brand new series called Life's Healing Choices. We all have a train wreck of wrong and poor choices. We want to start on a pathway to freedom and recovery from whatever it is we are dealing with. And the first choice that we're going to talk about today is the choice that we call the reality choice. I'll explain that in a second. But up on the screen, here's a list of things you could potentially have as issues to struggle with and recover from. A whole bunch of them. Here's the overworking, I'll admit that's me. It's hard for me to know when to stop being a pastor because it's not a nine-to-five job. You know that. Um, it's hard for me to, to figure that out. Uh, I'm struggling with that. Overeating, oh, you know that. I struggle with that. Eating the wrong stuff and too much of it. Thank God I've got a metabolism still working for me, but you know, at some point that it's not going to be working for me, so I know I've I got to exercise. Anyway, maybe that's for you. Overeating. Maybe it's overspending. Could be all three. Wow, you really got your work cut out for you now. Um, how about these words that start with G? Grief, guilt, gambling. Look at all these A words. Anger. Does anybody in here struggle with anger? Abuse, anxiety, alcohol, arrogance. There's no arrogant people, are, are there any here? Addictions. We often think of a recovery ministry as just addictions, but it's so much more than that, guys. That's just one slice of the pie. How about these D words? Death. You're struggling with the death of a loved one, and that is a wound that's deep. Divorce that ripped your heart out. Codependency. Control issues. Procrastination. Perfectionism. The list goes on and on and on. 
I actually want us to pause here in the middle of this sermon and pray for God to help make it clear to us what our issues are. Because this is a road to recovery. Eight, over the course of the eight weeks, eight choices of healing choices we need to make on the road to recovery. And until we get real, the rest of the steps don't matter. And so we really need to know what is it that is my issue that we need to get real with. So I'm going to pray right now for God and his spirit to lay it on our hearts. God, uh, I pray right now that your spirit would move in and among this church, well, this YMCA slash church, that you, by your spirit, would impress on people's hearts, on people's minds, what is their issue? God, I know every one of us have issues. Every one of us. Some of us admit it and some of us don't. But we are depending on you, God, today to make it clear to us what is the one prevalent lifelong struggle, a lifelong repetitive sin or a deep wound, a deep scar, a habit, a hurt, God, I pray right now you'll help the people in this room to identify what that issue is so that we can venture forth in this series with uh, relevance to apply what you're teaching in your scriptures to an area of our life in desperate need of the power of God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The first step to recovery is, we'll put it up on the screen, it's an acronym we're going to go through over the next eight weeks. And the first step is our realize I am not God. I know that sounds like a Sunday school thing, but you know, in your area of struggle, you tend to try to be God. We don't want to release issues to God. We tend to think we've got it covered. We tend to try to think we can do this on our own. We come up with all kinds of coping mechanisms and all kinds of strategies to try to fix what we actually don't have the power to fix. We just need to get honest. And the reality choice is that I need to realize I am not God. I am not going to solve this problem on my own. Basically, that's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. It says on this, uh, up on the screen, God blesses those who are poor. And in the original language, that means the, those who are poor in spirit, destitute, broken down. God blesses those who are poor in spirit and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. This is a great verse because God's going to tell you right there, this is the kind of people he wants to bless. That, that, I mean, if, if, if we care about our, our own personal selves, I see that as a promise and I run to that because I, I want God's blessings so badly. Don't you? In your area of struggle, it's not just the last couple of weeks, not just the past couple of months. Man, if you could have fixed it, you would have fixed it a long time ago. The fact that it is still there tells you you have reached the end of your ability to control this. You are out of control. You do not have your act together. There's not a single person in this room who has their act together with sin. Not me. And no, ever, no matter who you look around and say, that's the most mature spiritual person, they do not have their act together completely. We struggle with sin. All of us. All of us. And so all of us need to realize our need for him. And God will bless those who do realize their need for him. The simple truth is, it sounds so simple, but we don't realize our need for him to the degree that we need to. Why is it we will come to church, go to our Bible studies, but we still go out trying to fix our problems on our own strength? We know the good we should do, which is give it to God. We somehow, for some reason, refuse to do that. We need a dose of reality. The dose of reality is that I need to be desperate for him, to realize my need for him. We don't need more willpower. We don't need more self-effort. We don't need more promises. We don't need more effort. We need more of him. And if you get that right, you've begun your road to recovery. If you don't get that right, you don't even begin. You won't make it to step two because you didn't even get to step one. Clear? Let's look in Romans chapter 7. Here's a passage by um, a very awesome guy named Paul. And Paul is the greatest missionary there ever was in the early church. Thanks to God calling him as a missionary, churches got started and the early church just went crazy. And he wrote most of the New Testament. So if you're talking about spiritual maturity, he's pretty much the bomb.com. You know what I'm saying? Paul, the guy we call the apostle Paul, the guy who's the writer of the New Testament. Paul. The guy that so many churches like to call themselves, we are Saint Paul. Whatever. That Paul. Okay? He's good. But when you read what he has to say about his spiritual walk, you almost get to feel that that sounds like me. That sounds like something I would write. And I thought he would have his act together. 
he's wrestling with the fact that he's got holy standards that God sets out. The, the demands of God's law is so high, it's absolute perfection. He wholeheartedly agrees with that. Oh, I love God's law. I, uh, I so want to live by God's law, but I really struggle with my capacity to live accordingly. That's the gap. That's where we need the power of God and the grace of God. And he wrestles with this, and he's honest. Let's look at what he says in uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 14. The Bible says, so the struggle is not with the law. Well, that's not the problem, no. The struggle is not with the law, for it is spiritual, and it's good. No, the trouble is with me. I'm the trouble, for I'm all too human, a slave to sin. He's saying that if I'm a human, I'm a slave to sin. To be human is to be enslaved to sin. As long as we are still alive and breathing and on this planet, we are never going to be perfect. As long as you're human, you still have a struggle with sin. You, none of us have our act together, in other words. And it says in verse 15, but I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what's right, guys. I really do. But even Paul says this, but I don't do it. Instead, I actually do what I hate. What, St. Paul, did you just say that? Verse 16, but if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, well, this shows that I agree the law is good, and basically that I am not. I agree with that. So I am not the, the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I don't think he's claim, claiming innocence here. He's just saying there is a Paul inside of me that wants to do what's right. I see God's law, and everything in my heart wants to do that. But there's another Paul inside of me, a sinful, fallen Paul that cannot perform as perfect as I'd like. And verse 18 says, and I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. Nothing good there. And I want to do what is right, honestly, but I can't do it. I want to do what's good, but I don't do it. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I find myself doing it anyway. Can you relate to this? And then he repeats what he had said earlier, basically. If I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. It is sin, the sinful Paul living in me that does it. And then he says in verse 21, I have discovered this principle of life. And this is an interesting thing from Paul, uh, his principle of life. And see if you don't find it to be the principle of your life too. Here's the principle. That when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what is wrong. That's a pretty gnarly principle, isn't it? But isn't is in fact true in your life? When I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what is wrong. That's the human principle. I love God's law with all my heart. I really do. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. War. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Let's pause there. I think Paul's writing about how bad it is, and he's thinking, wow, I'm messed up. I'm in need. And he actually puts pen to it. Oh, what a miserable person I am. This is where I want to be, and this is where I am. I've got issues. Apostle Paul has issues. He doesn't have his act together. It's okay if you don't either. As that's the honest truth. We just need a dose of reality. He opened up and he was honest about it. In our small groups that are beginning this week, we got a sign-up table over there after church. I'm going to encourage you to sign up for a small group because we're going to study these same principles in small group. And I would like for you to do what Paul did. Open up. Get honest. There's all kinds of issues. And you just need to get beyond Bibles and Brownie discussion and get real. The reality is you have a need. That, if we're not going to have the guts to go there, we can't get to step two or three or four or five. I mean, what's the point? If we're not going to take this path and realize the first step, the reality choice is that I got a problem and I can't fix it because I am not God. And if we would open up and do that, it would be liberating. That is the beginning of your path to freedom. Here on the screen, I'll put this up. Here's the root cause of our problem. We're trying to play God. We're trying to fix things in our own power. We're trying to solve things in our own effort. We can make more promises. We can make more resolutions. We can try a little bit harder, and you just dig your, your ditch just a little bit deeper. We stink at playing God. We're horrible at being God. We don't have the capacity to do it very well. That's the reality. 
Jesus basically said that in John chapter 15, verse 5. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them, they will produce much fruit. But for apart from me, you can do zilch, nada, nothing. We don't have a choice or a hope. We don't have a chance. We can do nothing. He's basically just like, you know, a branch has to be connected to the, the vine. That's how the life source from the, the vine comes into the branch and the life change happens. The fruit happens. It's beautiful. That's the life source, the connection to God. But if you're separated from God, that branch out there on its own is just going to shrivel up and die. And you can try harder, that branch is not going to produce fruit. It can pray harder, that branch is not going to produce fruit fruit. It can make more promises. It can have more willpower. It can beg some more. It is not going to happen. According to the scriptures, Jesus says, if you want to do anything apart from me, you're not getting anywhere because you can do nothing. That's the reality choice. So how do we play God? Here are four ways we play God. We try to control things and play God. The first way, we try to control our image. We try to control our image, which basically is denial I want to keep my image well. I want everybody to think I got my act together. I don't want them to know I've got hurts. I don't want them to know I've got problems. I don't want them to know I've got wounds and scars and sins. I want that to look good. I've got to maintain and control my image. I've got to keep my mask up. We've always said at our church we want to be real, relevant, and relational. And if you can't get real with each other, you're really, honestly, what, it call, what I'm saying is it, that's trying to be God. You're trying to control your image Pretend that whatever's under the iceberg isn't even there. You're just covering it up and trying to fake everybody out. That, that's your attempt to fix your problem. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. Instead of opening up, we cover up. We ought to go to a small group and open up to each other. We also, number two, we try to control other people. We do this all the time. Parents try to control kids. Kids try to control parents. Husbands try to control wives and wives try to control husbands. And we use these little tools as weapons to try to inflict on each other so we can get our way and try to control those other people, right? We do it all the time. It could be anger. This is one of the most popular ones. Just scream and yell at your kids. I'll get them to do what you want them to do. Just scream your head off at your wife and she'll do what you want to do. If you just scream loud enough, get mad enough, well, I bet your wife really loves that. Does it work? No. But it's your way to try to control other people. It's your weapon. It's where you're saying, I'm God, you better listen to me and change. We use all kinds of whatever you know, tools. Fear, you better do this or else. Threats. Guilt, make them feel guilty all the time. Give them the silent treatment. All this is our method to control other people. You know what? We do really bad at that. That's not our business to control other people. We just need to let God be God and let's not do that. We also try to play God number three by trying to control our problems. I've been talking about that all morning. It's our sins, our problems that we have. Uh, we just think we're going to fix those. Uh, what we're doing, dude, we're trying to, trying to be God here. And we just can't. We don't have the capacity to do it. Number four, we try to control our pain. There are deep wounds in this church. Deep, deep wounds. Loved ones have died. That is not something you get over with very quickly. There are people who have been abused physically, spirit, uh, sexually, verbally, emotionally. And those wounds are not something you just get over by having somebody pray for you one time. This is a lifelong pain. Uh, there are people who uh, have been uh, uh, just been mistreated, they've been backstabbed, they've been lied about. I mean, the pain is huge. And so, unfortunately, when we try to play God with the pain, what we do is we ignore it, we sweep it under the rug, we deny it, and it comes out in other ways. We medicate it. We drown it. We find some addiction to make us forget it. So that's our solution to fix our problem. And it's horrible. It makes it worse. We just are lousy at being God. The first step is realize he's God. I'm not. I got a problem, but I don't have the capacity to be God. If you admit it, um, you just have to be honest and say, I am not going to get better on my own. Just not. I'm not going to solve my problem. 
here are some consequences of playing God, and you're going to get some more into this in your small groups, but fear is number one are the consequences if you're trying to do this. If you're trying to manage your image and, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I got it all together, guys. You, know, you got your mask and just deathly afraid anybody's going to see something in you because then they'll see that you're wounded or you're not perfect, and then they won't like you. And so you live in constant fear of pleasing everybody. Now, I have issues with that. That's, that's a fear that you have. That's horrible. That's miserable. Some of us are living in that, and it's just, it just doesn't work. Lives of fear. Lives of frustration because it really stinks when you try to be God and you realize, you know, you're not going to be God. Your whole life it just becomes inflamed with frustration. This doesn't work. Number three is fatigue. You're going to wear yourself out. How long are you going to hold a God-sized boulder before you get tired? It's going to be exhausting trying to be God. And fourthly, you're going to have a life full of spiritual failure. We just don't have what it takes. To do this on our own. Two steps or two signs that you might be in denial. Number one is right now what's running through your mind is, oh, well, my problems aren't that bad. That's a denial. Like I said earlier, if you could have solved this problem, you would have done it a long time ago. The fact that it's there proves you need help. And you're not going to fix it. You're not going to just willpower your way into it. According to the Bible, Jesus just said, it ain't going to happen. You can't do anything. You can do nothing. Second sign of denial, if you're sitting around thinking, well, this series must be for somebody else. <laughs> denial. It's you, dude. It is you. Apostle Paul just said, it's him, so I guarantee you, it's in you too. It is there. We might as well just admit it. I'm not God. I don't have it all together. You might as well just own up and open up and admit it. And if you know somebody very well, tell a good friend. Tell a spouse. I don't think they're going to be that surprised if they know you too well. If on the way home you fess up to your wife, honey, I have struggled with anger for my whole life. She's not going to be like, really? <laughs> Whoa. Newsflash. Dad's got anger issues. Or maybe you do have some secret hidden thing you've hidden very, very, very well because you're trying to be God by covering it up. It doesn't work. So you must well admit it. Even if they don't know it, God knows it, and you know it. You just got to admit it. And if you want the first step on the road, you need to have a dose of reality. I got a problem, and I don't have the capacity in me to fix it. I've spun out of control. My issue is not going to be resolved in my power, and I need God. So we don't need more good intentions. We don't need more willpower. We don't need more promises. We need more God. And those who realize their need for God are the people God blesses. One more verse. Um, I want to shut up. Oh, there's two verses. But the first one is James 4, 6 says a very simple principle. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's the third time the alarm's gone off. Try to ignore that, but I'll just acknowledge that. Anyway, God gives grace to the humble. Think about your issue. Do you want God's grace? Do you want God's power? Do you want God's healing? The Bible here has just told you where it's found. If you will humble yourself and open up, God will give grace to the humble. But if you're one of those proud, arrogant people who maintain your mask and deny the obvious, what does God do to the proud? He doesn't ignore them. He directly opposes them. Good luck solving your problem on your own when God's against you. You might as well say, God, I've got an issue. I humble myself before you, and I need you desperately. Here's the other verse I was going to say. Back in Romans, Paul came to the end of himself, and he wrote, oh, man, I am so miserable. But there's a glimmer of hope. He points us to the answer. In verse 24, he says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? He says, Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. No matter what your problem is, the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God he's given us a way. And all we need is one way, and he is the way, and he's all we need. We've got to be attached to the branch, because he said without him, we got nothing. But with him, we got God. So I just want to challenge you to humble yourself 
But today I'm going to ask you to do some things that are a little bit unusual or different. But that's okay. Um, in a minute, we're going to sing a song. I'm going to ask we stand up, and I want us to raise our hands in worship. The Bible says to raise your hands in worship. But there's another reason why I want you to raise your hand, because it is the universal sign of surrender. Here's the dose of reality. You need to surrender. You need to give this to God. And I'm asking you physically, tangibly to say, I'm giving this to you, God. My way has been a train wreck. It is ruining my life. It is ruining the lives of people around me. I've made a stinking mess of it. I've given it to you. You are all I, we're going to sing a song that says, you are my healer. You are all I need. You're more than enough. And so when you raise your hands, this is you surrendering this to God and saying, Jesus, I need you and I acknowledge you are more than enough. Clear? Before we do that, I want us to humble ourselves with the universal sign for surrender, and that's kneeling on our knees in prayer. So what we're going to do, I'm, just, I'm going to say a prayer in a second. I would like for us to turn around and uh, sit down, uh, or kneel down, and just kneel there at your chair. And if you are not in a place physically where that's capable, no worries, okay? Or if you don't want to, no worries. But let me encourage all of us to bow our knees and humble ourselves before God and say, oh God, I desperately, desperately need you. Desperately. After all, we came here to meet him. Let's humble ourselves before him and ask that he will do what only he can do. When are we going to stop doing things our way and start doing things God's way? When are we going to get a clue? The reality is we got nothing to offer, but God, Christ has everything. Your opportunity to freedom begins here. You can cover it up or you can open up. You can do this in your way, or you can do it in God's. So we're going to start by on our knees, humbling ourselves and asking for his power. And then we're going to stand, and we're going to surrender this issue to God and let it go. All right? So if you're okay with that, let's bow our knees, and then let's pray, and then we'll sing.